good evening. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Westminster. It's so good to see you here tonight. And uh, I just want to welcome you to make yourself at home while you're here. Our choir has been working to uh, work on this uh, piece for you tonight, this program, The Life and Story of John Newton in, in Story and Song. And so please, uh, please keep us in your prayers. We're not professionals. We're not here to entertain anyone. We're here to think about the testimony of this man, John Newton. We're familiar with Amazing Grace. We sing it often, and it's one of the most familiar hymns. But tonight, hopefully, we'll connect a broader story as we think about the life of John Newton, how God reached into his heart and into his life. So welcome tonight. I'm glad that you took the time to be here with us this evening. Pray for the choir. Uh, pray for the needs that uh, we have in our church family. And thank you, guests. Thank you, family and friends that are here. Thank you so much for coming. We're looking forward to a great night. For those on Zoom, we're glad that you're able to connect and join with us as well and the technology that allows us to bring this to you. So make yourself comfortable, make yourself at home in the house of God here tonight, and be blessed and enjoy the story of John Newton. I'm going to ask uh, our uh, music uh, director, Brother Mike, to come and lead us in a word of prayer as we begin our service tonight. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity as we consider this message in song as we consider the, uh, the narrative of the life of your servant, John Newton, and the legacy of him as we get to think of it even several hundred years later, uh, that he being dead still speaketh. And thank you, Lord, for the circumstances that brought about these things in his life that, that changed him. And thank you for such a powerful testimony of a man whose life was changed by your son, Jesus Christ, and that gospel that we love so dearly. I pray for us as we sing, help us as we communicate this message to those who are within earshot, uh, those that might be hearing online. Again, thank you for the broad influence that this story has uh, even with us here tonight and will continue to have even throughout the years. And we ask for your blessing to be upon this service and upon this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to sing as a congregation to begin our service tonight. We invite you to turn in your songbook, in your red songbook. And while you uh, grab that close by, let me be a good host to you tonight. If this is your first time here, you've never been, been to the facilities. If you go out these doors, go down the hallway to your right. If you look on the left, you'll find the restrooms, the facilities there, a drinking cooler. And then also stick around afterwards. We've got some fellowship and some food and things and refreshments. So make yourself at home. You've got your red songbook and we're going to sing 180. 85 in uh, in your red hymnal great hymns of the faith glorious things of thee are spoken now before we sing let me explain verse number two we're going to have the ladies sing first and then verse uh, and then followed that by the men and I'll try to cue you when we come to that part and then when I turn to face the choir take that as a cue if I forget to seat you you can all be seated by the time I turn around and lead the choir in the end of the song okay so now that you got a lot to remember, thanks, Pastor. You know? <laughs> but uh, let's sing this song and go ahead and stand with me if you would. Glorious things of thee are spoken, 185. Glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion city of our God, he whose word cannot be broken. Form thee for his own abode on the rock of ages founded. What can shake thy sure repose with salvation's walls surrounded? Thou mayest smile at all thy foes. Ladies. Supply thy sons and daughters, and all fear of want remove. Who can faint while such a river ever flows their thirst to sway? Grace, which like the Lord the giver never fails from age to 
church cemetery in only England, these words can be found on an old granite tombstone. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was, by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. This epitaph, written by John Newton himself, marks the final resting place for the old sea captain. Although his songs have been sung for over 200 years, few today realize the wickedness of his former life, nor how the grace of God saved John from his sin. Here, then, is the story of Rev. John Newton, author of the gospel hymn, Amazing Grace. John Newton was the son of a well-known and much-respected British sea captain. Since his father sailed the Mediterranean much of the time, the raising of the boy was left to his mother. Although John's father scoffed at any talk of God, his mother was a dedicated Christian. Each day she gave John a lesson from the Bible and prayed that God would someday make a preacher out of him. On Sundays, Mrs. Newton took her son to the dissenting chapel of Dr. David Jennings to hear him preach of Christ and the need for personal salvation from sin. John also heard the powerful singing of Christian hymns, among which was a, a new song written by Dr. Isaac Watts. When I survey the wondrous cross on which, my, on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride.
Although John had the benefit of a godly mother, he was to lose this advantage at an early age. When John was six years old, his mother developed a bad cough which would not go away. Needing some rest, she boarded out John with a neighbor and went to stay with a Mr. and Mrs. Catlett. Instead of getting better, Mrs. Newton grew progressively worse until death overtook her just before John's seventh birthday. In spite of the loss, the few years of godly instruction would not be in vain. The memory of his mother and her teaching from the Word of God would later come back to him. Difficult times were to lie ahead for the boy, but John would later marvel at the care and protection that came from the Lord.
After returning from the sea some months later, John's father remarried and sent him away to school. John grew weary of formal education after two years and quit to join his father's ship as a sailor. Little did 11-year-old John know what would wait for him as a young seaman. For the next six years, John sailed the Mediterranean as part of the British merchant fleet. As the years at sea passed by, the youthful John began to pull away from the fear of God and to seek after a life of wickedness. Of those degenerating years, John later said, I began to pray, to read the scripture, and keep sort of a diary. I was presently religious in my own eyes, but, alas, the seeming goodness had no solid foundation, but passed away like a morning cloud, or the early dew. I was soon weary, gradually gave it up, and became worse than before. Instead of prayer, I learned to curse and blaspheme, and was exceedingly wicked. If anyone on board the ship gave any reverence to Christ, it certainly was not from the captain's son. Many more years were to pass before the cursing lips of John Newton would speak praise of the Savior's name. One day during shore leave, John received a letter from a lady who knew him when he was a boy. It was from Mrs. Catlett, the one who cared for his mother when she was sick. The letter invited John for a visit, if he should ever be in the area. John welcomed the invitation and set out for the Catlett's home. He was greeted at the door by their 13-year-old daughter, Polly. Although John was somewhat older than Polly, he suddenly became infatuated at the sight of this young lady. In fact, John became so overwhelmed in her presence that he could hardly think to speak. For John, it was love at first sight. Even though he became tongue-tied and his behavior was foolish, it would be some time before I realized John's true affection for me. John later said, I was impressed with an affection for her which I never abated or lost uh, or lost its influence over me. None of the scenes of misery and wretchedness I afterwards experienced ever banished her for an hour from my waking thoughts for the seven following years. John overstayed his visit with the Catlets and finally decided to return to port where he thought he would find his waiting ship. Though he had been warned, he gave no thought about the impending war with France and the press gangs 
who were capturing wayward sailors for service in the British Navy. On his way back, John walked right into one of those press gangs. It was no use trying to escape. John was arrested and compelled to board the Harwich Man of War, where he was ordered into military service. John became so distressed by the turn of events that he reasoned that there could be no God who cared for his soul. Of those days on the British warship, Newton later said, Like an unwary sailor who quits his post just before a rising storm, I renounced the hopes and comforts of the gospel at the very time when every other comfort was about to fail me. With thoughts of Polly on his mind, John determined that he could no longer submit to the restrictive life of the Navy. As the Harwich prepared to set sail, John deserted the ship. For three days, this stubborn sailor thought he was forever free until a group of Marines caught up with him. John was arrested and forced to march the 25 miles back to the ship. He was publicly whipped by the captain, stripped of his rank, and thrown onto his bunk where whiskey was poured into his stinging and bleeding flesh. John's back still burned with pain a few days later when he heard that the captain was about to trade one of his crew for two good sailors aboard another ship. Newton pleaded to be the one traded. The presence of this young, rough young sailor had brought nothing but trouble to the crew, and the captain was glad to get rid of him. John was delighted with his freedom and thought he could now live as he pleased. However, John Newton's real troubles were only beginning. The ship to which he had been traded was a slave ship, engaged in a business of purchasing black natives along the coast of Africa for transportation to the New World. The owner of the ship, Mr. Amos Clough, would take some of the crew into the jungles, barter with tribal chiefs for the natives, and herd the human cargo back to the waiting ships. Below the deck, the future slaves were packed tightly into the holds where brutality and sickness became commonplace and the lusts of the sailors ran unchecked. Along with the others, John began to relish in the wickedness on board the slaver. Newton's life soon became one of complete lack of restraint, foul language, and moral debauchery. Even the hardened sailors eventually lost respect for John Newton. To gain control of the rebellious sailor, Amos Clough treated John as though he was among the lowest of slaves. Kept in chains, John was barely fed enough to be kept alive and became what he called a servant of slaves. John's situation continued to worsen before he re realized how wretched his life was without the Lord.
John endured this humiliation for nearly two years. He finally was able to arrange for another slave to smuggle a letter back to his father, requesting a rescue from his horrid condition. When the letter arrived, his father sent Captain Manistee of the Greyhound to look along the African coast for the wayward son. Some months later, John was miraculously found, and arrangements were made for his release. During the long voyage home, John passed the time away by devising new swear words and ridiculing the Bible. In spite of his language and moral perversion, it is strange that John began to read a book by Thomas a Kempis entitled The Imitation of Christ. When he read of the Judgment Day of the Lord, Newton began to wonder what would happen if he should have to stand before Christ and be condemned for his sin. With those thoughts on his mind, John went to sleep that night. After a while, a storm began to blow. In a short time, the wind became severe, and large waves began to break against the greyhound. John woke up and managed to escape his quarters just as a huge wall of water crashed over the ship. Part of the ship broke away, and John saw a fellow sailor and much of the cargo fall into the sea. Newton frantically took to working the ship's pumps to keep it afloat. Others struggled to save the ship and their own lives as well. For the remainder of the night and well into the next day, John Newton pumped hard until he was about frozen from the ice-cold spray. After many hours, the weary Newton finally lashed himself to the ship's wheel and desperately battled to keep the sinking vessel from capsizing into the angry waves. By late the next afternoon, the storm still blew with all its fury. The ship was barely staying afloat. The crew was almost completely exhausted for John Newton and all aboard it looked as if the end was near. As John Newton struggled at the ship's wheel, his mind began to recall Bible verses that he had learned many years before at his mother's knee. Conviction of his waywardness began to overcome him as he thought on such verses as Proverbs 1, 27 and 28. Your as a whirlwind, When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They they shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. At first, John concluded that his sin was too great to be forgiven. Then he began to think about the life of Christ and of his sacrificial death. He remembered that Jesus did not come to die for himself, but to take the punishment for distressed sinners who should put their trust in him. The Savior died for me. My soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think he died for me.
The storm raged until it finally lost its strength. The weary John left the ship's wheel and obtained a copy of the Bible. He began a search to see if Christ could really save a sinner as vile as he. John was impressed by the story of the prodigal son whose father ran to greet the wayward boy. As the battered ship slowly limped its way back home, John Newton accepted the loving grace of God and Christ's death as the penalty for his sin. The crew soon noticed that he was a changed man, for after his salvation, John Newton never swore again. When the crippled ship finally arrived home, Captain Manisty offered the 23-year-old Newton the position of first mate on one of his ships. Before leaving for the sea again, John went to pay his respects to the Catlets and to inquire of Polly, now 20 years of age. He enjoyed the Catlets' warm friendship and especially the presence of Polly, whom he had not seen in four years. Newton found that he still had a strong affection for Polly as before, yet became tongue-tied as ever when trying to express his thoughts of love and marriage. The best he could do was ask permission to write. After leaving, he wrote and signed the letter, Your most faithful and ardent admirer and servant, J. Newton. With thoughts of Polly on his mind, John set sail on the Brownlow, a slave ship transporting unsuspecting African natives for servitude in the new land of America. At first, Newton continued to read the Bible and to pray for God's blessing. As he sailed out of sight from England that year, he also drifted away from the Lord. Except for his former profanity, John became almost as bad as before his conversion. Though John Newton had fallen into wickedness again, the Lord was not through with him. Stopping to purchase more black slaves, John became sick with fever, and that again brought him to a place of submission to the Lord's will. Of that time, John later said, Weak, almost delirious, I rose from my bed and crept to a retired part of the island, and there found a renewed liberty to pray. I durst make no more resolves, but cast myself before the Lord, to do with me as he should please. Thereafter, John would often say that he was incapable of standing a single hour without continual fresh supplies of strength and grace from the fountainhead.
John continued writing to Polly, and she responded with notes of kindness. With absence, the hearts grew fonder. John prepared to ask Polly's hand in marriage when he returned. When the long trip home was completed, John went to stand before his beloved Polly. He did his best to say the words he had often rehearsed in his mind. At first, I refused. I didn't have However, John insisted with all sorts of reasonings and said that I would be better off as Mrs. John Newton rather than a happy Polly Catlett. Finally, I gave my hand in consent. John stood speechless. We fell forever in love and were happily married on the 1st of February, 1750. For the next four years, the 25-year-old Newton became the captain of a slave ship, ferrying black native, African natives to the British colonies in, in America. Although John did not enjoy the long months away from home and his Polly, he looked on his work as a respectable occupation. After all, slavery was a universal practice of the day and protected by British law. Later in life, John would say, During the time I was engaged in the slave trade, I never had the least scruple as to its lawfulness. I was, upon the whole, satisfied with it as the appointment Providence had marked out for me. However, I was sometimes shocked with an employment that was perpetually conversant with chains, bolts, and shackles. Though he was now a Christian who tried to show kindness to the slaves, it was several more years before the new Captain Newton became appalled at what he would call the dreadful effects of slave trade on the minds of those who engage in it. After three voyages at sea, John grew weary of the long separations from Polly and came home to stay in the year 1754. He forever left his profession as a slave ship captain and became a tide surveyor in Liverpool. Those that knew John encouraged him to tell his life story and to speak out for the Lord. He soon became acquainted with George Whitfield and John Wesley, who also urged him to serve the Lord with whatever abilities he had. More important than that, his wife now publicly confessed Christ as Savior. In 1756, John was invited to formally give his testimony from a church pulpit. His first attempt at public speaking was a complete disaster, and John wondered if God could ever use him. However, John felt a continual, continual calling of God to preach as requests for his testimony poured in from around the countryside. After several years of preparation, John was called to be the pastor of a small congregation in Olney. The 39-year-old pastor often wondered why Christ would put him into the ministry, for he later would confess, No one could be more unworthy, for I had been a long, a, long a persecutor and blasphemer and a prolificate. And considering my situation, connections, and habits of life, no one could be more unlikely. For 15 years, the Reverend Newton preached the word of God to those in Olney. His life testimony as a former slave ship captain was especially effective in winning the lost. His general love for people and his straightforward preaching brought in people until the building was filled to overflowing. Of the many who sat under John Newton's preaching was a poet named John Cooper. John suggested that Cooper should write some hymn poem, poems that could be sung by the congregation. In 1779, Newton published a collection of Cooper's songs along with many of his own and called it Olney Hymns. Among the many songs that expressed man's sin and need of salvation was Cooper's new hymn, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Sinners, 
John never forget his life at sea. Sometimes he would wear a sailor's uniform and enter the pulpit with a Bible in one hand and a hymn book in the other. He would often begin a message by saying, I commit my soul to my gracious God and Savior, who mercifully spared me when an apostate, a blasphemer, and an infidel, and delivered me from the state of misery on the coast of Africa into which my obstinate wickedness had plunged me, who had pleased to admit I'm sorry, who had pleased to admit me, though most unworthy, to preach his glorious gospel. John's life as a minister for God was not without its disappointments. After forty years of marriage, his beloved wife Polly died in the year seventeen ninety. Their lives had been a storybook romance. For the next 17 years, John continued to minister without her at his side. John never ceased to be amazed at the grace of God that turned him from a cursing sailor into a mighty proclaimer of God's word. He continued to preach past his 80th year. When his eyesight began to fail, someone suggested that he give up preaching, and to that he quickly replied, What? Shall an old African blasphemer stop while he can still speak? At the close of his life, the frail Newton said, My memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. At the age of 82, John Newton left the shores of his life for the glories of heaven. Over the years, Newton's study of Scripture had convinced him of the wrong in human slavery. A few months before he died, Parliament passed a law which forever banned the slave trade in the British Empire. Although memories have faded of the slave trade, of his courtship with Polly Catlett, and of the old sea captain preaching to thousands, the salvation testimony of John Newton has yet to be forgotten with the words that he wrote, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound! 
that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am fi- found, was blind, but now I see. Take your Bible briefly. Join me in 1 Timothy chapter 1. What a great message in song and story. And much of my work is done for me already. But it, we would be remiss if we didn't open the Bible and consider the great truth of Scripture that we've enjoyed tonight with the testimony, the life of John Newton. I draw your attention in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 12, where Paul the Apostle writes to a young man, Timothy, in the ministry, his protege, his son in the faith. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. The life of John Newton in so many ways parallels that of Paul the Apostle. As we think about where Paul had come from, we know him as Paul. He was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. To do that under the power and filling of the Holy Spirit as Jesus had called him. But prior to that, we know Paul's conversion story. His salvation happened on the road to Damascus with letters in his hand to go persecute Christians, followers of the way. The way being Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life. Paul was zealous in his persecution. He was raging 
with zeal like Phineas type rage against Christians. As he was on his way to Damascus, the Lord stopped him, smote him with blindness, arrested him, and said, Saul, Saul, that's his Hebrew name, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The idea of a prick there is kind of like goading an animal if you compare it and study other places in the Scripture. The Lord was trying to guide Saul, and he was kicking like a raging bull in a china shop against everything God wanted to do for him. And the connection that Paul made on the road to Damascus was that when he was persecuting Christians, He was actually persecuting Jesus Himself. This is a man who had just witnessed the stoning of Stephen, the martyr of the early church, whose testimony looked so much like the Lord Jesus Christ. It must have resonated with Paul very deeply. Paul talks about some of the troubles he had after he got saved. It would be years. He would be trained uh, over a long time and put into the ministry by the Lord Jesus Christ, called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He would go on many missionary journeys and establish churches in every area that he traveled to, up through Asia and down through uh, Corinth. And then on his last journey, he was headed back to Jerusalem with uh, some things he wanted to do. He wanted to worship. He wanted to bring some alms to the poor saints in Jerusalem. He wanted to see how they were doing. And he ran into some things that he never expected. He was asked questions about what he was teaching. And he was uh, essentially, uh, eventually, he was arrested and put in prison for a couple of years for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because people didn't understand him. He was an innocent man uh, regarding preaching the the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they couldn't couldn't, uh, bear with him with what he was teaching because of their Judaism and their their religiousness. They couldn't get past the law of Moses in their mind. And they thought Paul was teaching things that he was never teaching. He gave his defense multiple times before multiple magistrates and rulers and governors. And eventually he would appeal to Caesar, which would take him all the way to Rome, which in that day would be the ends of the earth. And this man would also be in storms on the sea and wreckages. And he would also assure others of faith in God as well along his journey. And Paul, once he landed in Rome, would be free. He would be under house arrest. He would, he would be arrested there, but he would be at liberty to preach Jesus. No one hindered him from preaching Jesus for two years and better while he spent his time in bonds in Rome. And we have letters that he wrote to individuals and churches while he was in, in prison in Rome. We see how through... Paul's willingness to serve, God did exactly what he wanted to do. Compare that with what we looked at with John Newton. Is not our God a gracious God to take someone as wretched as John Newton involved in such atrocious things? You know, we're removed from time and distance from both of these men, the Apostle Paul and John Newton. But some of the sins that plagued them are still sins that plague us today. And this world is a broken, fallen world. But I'm here to tell you tonight, as we've highlighted the parallels between John Newton and the Apostle Paul, their former lives and how they were changed by the grace of God. As we think about how God's grace came to each one of these men, I also remember how God's grace came to me in my life. And God's grace extends to every one of us. Grace will meet you right where you are, in whatever condition that is. God has sufficient grace. I want you to reflect with me for just a moment. As we approach Thanksgiving this week, I ask you this simple question. What has grace done for you? The message of the gospel is clear. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He didn't come to save the righteous. Not those who think they have no need of a Savior. No, He came to save sinners. And of those sinners, Paul said that He was chief. 
Similarly, John Newton, reflecting on his life, penned the words to amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Today, if you find yourself distanced from God, wandering on life's vast sea of uncertainty, wondering what storm is brewing if you're in a storm or just come through a storm or a storm on the horizon. Storms affect us. I want you to know this. If you're burdened by the weight of your sin and your transgressions against a holy God, know this, that the same grace that reached the Apostle Paul, the same grace that was extended and reached John Newton, the same grace that reached into my life as a 14-year-old young man, and many here sitting tonight can testify the same grace that reached into their life can also reach into your life. And God can save a sinner like me. I challenge you, if you have not freely received His grace by faith through Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross of Calvary for you, friend, then won't you open your life to the Lord Jesus? He invites you to come to Him. And I want to also extend that invitation to you at this moment. Would you bow your head with me for a quiet time of contemplation? And I'm going to ask a pianist to come and just play quietly and let you think about the grace that God has extended to you. Live in the reality of that grace every day. Let it shape you. Let it mold you. All of your conversations, all of the steps your feet take, know that you're planting them by the grace of God. What has grace done for you? Lord Jesus, I ask you tonight, if there's one listening, one watching that has yet to receive your free grace by faith, I pray that tonight would be the night they realize that they are separated from you by their sin, and their sin has a heavy cost. That sin must be paid for, and the Bible talks about it being paid for eternity in a place called hell. Lord John Newton was on his way there but you intervened in his life. I was on my way there, but your grace met me where I was. And your goodness led me to change my mind and have repentance toward you and faith toward my Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that someone would tonight, someone watching, would trust Jesus Christ as their Savior before it's eternally too late for them. That the same grace that wrapped its arms around John Newton would also comfort them tonight with peace from Jesus our Savior, that their sins have been forgiven and washed under the blood. Thank you for this message and story and song about this man's life, how it continues to impact us today. Be with each one that's here, the family, the friends that are with us, our guests. Lord, I pray that they would leave refreshed and stay for fellowship with us if they can. And I ask that, Lord, you would settle their heart tonight about this matter of salvation and faith in Jesus Christ. We pray these things in His precious and holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.